So welcome to the course Cryptology. So in this course you're going to learn a lot of things about how cryptology works, how it gets broken, I mean how it doesn't work. And so one of the sources of information for you in particular as the students attending this course is my homepage for this course. So that's at hyperloop.org slash Tanya teaching crypto21 and I assume you have already been there. Now for this introductory lecture I want to point out something that you hopefully have as well. Namely, you go in there with HTTPS, and this S stands for secure. So you're connecting to this page in a secure manner. And that, let me point out, is in this box. When you click on the lock, you're actually going to see some more of it. So you're going to get to this one, which helpfully in green here says you are securely connected to the site. Well, that sounds good, and as a normal user, you should be happy about this. But as a student taking a course in cryptology, you should be asking, hey, are you sure? What does it mean? How does it work? So you are the person who should be clicking on this for more information. So let's see what comes up there. It gives you a pop-up which shows page info and in particular the security information um, about well, what's all behind it. And we're going to be interested in what's down here under the technical details. And we're going to make sense of all these three or four letter abbreviations that might look fairly random to you. Now, the string there, this sequence of letters, is just an indicator. This tells your computer, hey, look into that box, use the algorithms that are in this box. But actually, we're going to see what this ASGCM stands for, what Shard 384 is. And okay, this is using something, well, keys, so that's. In cryptology speech, if you have a secret, we talk about those things as keys. But the information here is actually not very interesting. It doesn't tell us everything we want to know. So let's remember the string a little bit, and let's also remember that it ends with TL 1.3. So to inspect what you're actually using with the page, um, let's go to something that inspects this page. For instance, the Qualsys or SSL Labs uh, test about it. And so well, I went to that page, I analyzed what it thinks about my cipher suites, so what cryptography I'm offering, and then um, in TLS 1.3, so that's this first block of algorithms here, um, I was ended in chart 384, so we're in this first row here, and these are listed in order that my server prefers these. Okay, so my browser talking to my server actually was happy with the first choice for my server, which is also the most secure of the options, um, and so we agreed on this one. If my browser wouldn't have been happy with it, we would be choosing one of the lower ones. And okay, if I wouldn't even speak TLS 1.3, if I'm an older browser, then I would be in these categories. Now the information that this gives in addition is that also there are some stuff here in black, namely it says ECD agent, it stands for elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman, and it tells us which elliptic curve it's using, namely X25519, and it tells us that there's also something to do with RSA, which is a system that you might have seen before, either as a hobby or as a previous course. And we're gonna go again into RSA, but first we're gonna deal with understanding what elliptic curve if you have is. And then we're gonna look further into the other parts, for instance, this ASGCM, chart 84, the chart 20, 403005. And we're also going to get into parts that are, well, more interesting if you're looking at it from a chess perspective. Namely, we're going to look into what it means that some of those are marked as weak. Because if you com successfully complete this course, you're one of the people in later life who might be asked to make recommendations. What order should I put the cipher suite in? So, well, for my server, I'm doing that. But for your own server or for the server of the company that you might end up working in, hey, you, cryptographer, you did this course back then. What order should I put those in? And then you should have some, well, informed idea of in which order you want to put those. And in particular, if I'm focusing on these two rows here, then the entries, yeah, that's all very much the same until I get to this single spot. So there's a GCM, which is in green, so it calls these things as good, and there's a CBC, which they think is weak. And we're going to figure out why this one is considered weak and that one is considered strong. I mean, it's in green. 
So you're going to see a lot of pip analysis in this. And you also see that in, like, in this example here, you're seeing that it's like a, well, they say Chinese menu. So it's like you pick one of each type. So you're going to see something where, okay, for instance, here, most of those have this 2019, but for instance, there is also some which are no EC, just VH with and then many more bits. Um, or you might encounter something where the SHA value is just 256 instead of 384. Then this cha cha 20 polyphenol 5 seems to be playing the same role as the ASGCM. And so we're going to see each of these categories. And so also in this course, you're going to see pieces. And they together, you need all of these pieces in order to make a secure connection. Um, but it's not that they individually build on each other. So for instance, it can totally be that you understand one piece and you have deficiency in the others, and you're still going to be able to understand the next part. Now, I hope you will all follow along, and please, please, please ask if there's anything unclear. But it is not like your typical course where you have things building on each other, but it's, it's more compartmentalized. For each of these pieces, we're going to learn some of the systems, and we're going to learn how secure they are, whether they're weak or how weak they are, and so on. As a bigger structure, you should be asking yourself, hey, I'm now talking to the server. How can this actually be that I talk to the server securely? Well, how can it have this S in the HTTPS? I've never met the server. I mean, you didn't go to my server room and shook hands with it and say, hey, well, uh, let's use this as our secret. So you seem to still have some shared secret without ever having met my server. Also, how can you be sure that you're talking to the correct server, that it's not some imposter side selling you weak cryptography that will tell you, oh yeah, use CVC, never use GCM, or only use TLS 1.0 or something. So how do you know that you're talking to the correct server? Also, how does it actually work to send this data securely? And when you say, okay, well, you're sending important information, say your credit card number and an amount of how much you're willing to pay, well, you're kind of relying on it to be transmitted securely, but also unmodified. I mean, it's great that nobody can see your credit card, but it would be quite a disaster if an attacker could just poke it and then change your payment of 10 euros to 1,000 euros. So how is it secured against modification? And there's, well, roughly two categories that we're seeing in, in cryptography. There's, there's an important distinction between what we call public key cryptography and what we call symmetric key cryptography. Let me start with the public key cryptography. Even though it's somewhat more complicated, it's actually what we're going to see first in our course. Um, and it's also like the first thing when you're talking to a server, namely each user, say your server, the browser, each user must have made two keys. As a public key and a private key. And as those names suggest, well, you must keep the private key secret, private, don't give it to anybody because that is the thing that makes you yourself. So this is how people will sh be sure that they're talking to you or this is how you can decrypt with nobody else. And then there's the public key, which you can make public, you can post online. This is what you will get from my server. You will not get the secret key from my server. You will get the public key from my server. And so it must be hard to take the public key and recover this private key. And it's often in those systems we're going to look at, it's fairly easy if you have the private key to compute the public key. It's not a must. You can also have one operation which gives you both and you can't easily move from one to the other. But it's really, really important that you cannot get from the public information to the private information. And we're using public key cryptography for these first two tasks. So you're getting a secret with my server without ever having met my server, and you are sure that you're talking to the correct server. So it gives you authenticity in a way that you have not met my server and you're still sure you're talking to the right thing. So that's why we use public key cryptography. And then the other one, the symmetric key cryptography, well, there it's more like this traditional cryptography that you might have played with, say, if you have seen the Caesar cipher, you and the other end know exactly how you encrypt and you also then know how to decrypt. So the knowledge of the system and the knowledge of this key is symmetric between those users. 
but it is a key between each pair of users. So if you want to talk to my server, you have a key with my server. If you want to talk to your bank, you have a key to your bank. If you talk to an email, you have a key with your email. So you need to keep track of all these key pairs. And those are not the same key pairs. And of course, this is the key that is decrypting the connection to my server, so you better keep that secret. And, well, also the one to your bank and also the one to your email. So there's only one key for each pair, and that key you must be keep, must be kept secret. Also, another example is if you're doing full disk encryption, you actually <laughs> sort of talking to yourself. You're talking to yourself at a later time, so you're encrypting your data under the key that only you know in this case to yourself. And then later, well, you come back to your data and you recover it by decrypt. Now, semantic systems seem less powerful, but they're often faster, or often a lot faster than public key systems. So we actually have use cases for public key crypto, which I have already up there, and then for symmetric key crypto, we let that do the bulk of the work. So for symmetric key cryptography, we're letting that cover the uh, bulk encryption, so we're sending all the data with it, and we're also making sure that it uh, gets this uh, modification list, so we're making sure that there's integrity protection on the message. And that is what we're getting very cheaply with symmetric cryptography, and so, well, each part has their own world. And in this course, we're going to go in this order that I just described. So first, we're going to do public key crypto and then symmetric key crypto. And, well, we're going to come back to some more advanced concepts in public key cryptography towards the end. So it's not over when I get to symmetric key cryptography. But we're first going to focus on how we're getting these keys and how we're making sure it's the right party we're talking to. And only after that will we figure out how the symmetric cryptography works. That's it for today. Stay tuned for more.